Well, welcome to the last presentation of today, the third day of WAF Virtual, which is going to be given by Ralph Johnson and Jean Ma, who are both with Perkins and Will, large American multinational uh, firm of architects and designers. Ralph is the Global Design Director, and Jean is a principal uh, in health design. They're both experts in, in, in health, and some of you may remember that Ralph, uh, Ralph's design for the Rush Memorial Hospital in Chicago won the health category one year when we were in uh, Singapore some years ago. They're going to talk about the future of healthcare design and, and healthcare provision in the light of, of COVID, how it's going to force an evolution of the hospital uh, from where we are now into the future. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Good to uh, see you. Uh, virtually. Uh, Gene and I are going to present uh, a, a, a uh, history of the typology, at least from a modern period of the hospital, the evolution of the hospital from uh, the modern uh, movement uh, up into the present. Uh, also look at uh, current ideas that we have in our current practice about uh, uh, continuing to evolve the healthcare practice and health care. And then Gene is going to talk about the future of medicine and, and what it might imply for hospitals uh, in the future. Uh, certainly the uh, hospitals and uh, in the early modern movement uh, were impacted and all, actually all modern architecture was impacted in early 20th century by uh, tuberculosis, uh, which led to the, uh, the early modern, first really modern hospitals uh, uh, which, uh, since there was no direct uh, uh, solution to uh, tuberculosis, it was mainly more about getting people out into the open, uh, into the sun, uh, breathing uh, fresh air. Uh, and many modern, famous modern buildings were hospitals at the time, the Palmo uh, Sanatorium, uh, Alto Spalma Sanatorium, and the Zonostral Sanatorium on the right uh, were some very famous uh, early modern buildings driven by a uh, solution to tuberculosis. Uh, and also tuberculosis also affected school design and there was a, a movement for the open air school. And you see a number of schools here, uh, Marcel Lodge's uh, school in France and in the, in the US, um, Richard Neustra's open school. Uh, and so health, the idea of health and architecture really affected the, and, and, and influenced the whole polemic of of modern architecture. Uh, Corbusier used it as a, a tool against the traditional house. He called the traditional house uh, uh, unhealthy and, and, and houses should be, uh, modern houses should be machines for health. So there was a very strong tie between health and modern architecture and the evolution of modern architecture. Uh, up and then after the after World War II, uh, a number of things happened. There, there was a solution for tuberculosis uh, through the discovery of antibiotics. There was the introduction of air conditioning, and the whole hospital typology changed. Uh, better, better care, uh, more specialized hospitals, which led to larger hospitals, and uh, like I said, better care, but. Uh, the, the negative uh, part was that technology took over and, and maybe the, the relationship the, to the outdoors, to fresh air, to, to the environment wasn't uh, taken into consideration as much as it was earlier with the sanatoriums. You see a couple examples of that, the McMaster's Health Center around 1970, uh, which uh, Rainer Bannum called the, the uh, quintessential uh, megastructure hospital and a project by Perkins and Will, all uh, driven by technology uh, and plug and play kind of aesthetics. Next. So there were, around 1970, I think uh, there was kind of a questioning of, of uh, the, the overemphasis on technology and uh, the humaneness of the hospital. And there were a number of uh, schemes promote, beginning to be promoted and architects beginning to think about how to, how to reconfigure and re-examine re, uh, re the typology of hospitals. Certainly, 
uh, Le Corbusier's uh, Venice Hospital uh, was about actually integrating into the fabric of, of Venice, using that as a kind of clue for the layout of the hospital itself. It had streets and it was almost like a small a small town, a kind of math building that integrated into the fabric of the, of the city. Also, at that time, E. Todd Wheeler, who was the founder of Perkins Will's healthcare practice in the 50s, wrote a book that came out on healthcare planning. It was fairly standard healthcare planning, but at the end of the book, he lamented uh, the uh, overemphasis on the machine in hospital design. And, that, uh, and he presented uh, some schemes such as this one here, which was uh, the idea of hospital as a tent uh, with floating elements of of, uh, of, uh, of beds uh, in a tropical garden. So uh, trying to reimagine the typology, make it more humane, make it more uh, environmental, environmentally and uh, contextually responsive. So what we wanna do is, uh, kind of look at some of our recent work in light of a few key points and some of the explorations we've done in our recent work to evolve the typology. Uh, and that would be uh, response to conditions that are unknown, uh, take uh, looking at scale of the hospital, breaking the scale down to respond to culture, to breaking the scale down to respond to, to light air, similar to the sanatoriums, and using uh, evidence-based research as a form generator in the hospital. Next. So as Jeremy mentioned, the Rush Hospital, we did probably about 10 years ago, it was designed. It was uh, a somewhat traditional organization of beds sitting on top of diagnostic and treatment uh, for uh, plinth, but but adapted to uh, its surroundings using uh, and the diagnostic plate. The idea of of on stage and off stage, on stage being being for patients and visitors offstage being uh, the, the various uh, treat, treatment uh, areas, which, so this, this kind of gives a maximum uh, uh, relationship between a patient and, and treatment. And that was expressed on the outside of the building. Also the evolution of the, of the bed tower from a traditional cross-shaped plan, which went back to the 19th century into more fluid plan, which I'll talk about the advantages of that in terms of flexibility of the nursing unit. You can see the onstage area of the hospital kind of drops down the, the geometry of the beds drop to the lower level in the diagnostic plate and relate to the entry and uh, neighborhood surrounding the hospital. Whereas the other side, uh, is more relates more to a highway which leads to the central area of Chicago and has kind of almost a billboard effect with a large glass wall which actually lets light into the surgery corridor because we not only want light for patients and visitors but we want light for the people that are working in the building so we wanted to introduce and break down the scale of the diagnostic plate as well And then introducing uh, green areas in a fairly dense, tight site, vertical hospital, still introducing green areas, both for uh, lobbies, patient areas, as well as staff into the interstitial areas of the hospital. Next. You see the lobby here, and the lobby has a big impact on COVID. Uh, the hospital got a grant and you'll see it was a large open space. We actually introduced plants into the building through a kind of terrarium, which contained plants, but didn't integrate in with the 
uh, the environment uh, and the environment of the uh, or contaminate the environment of the hospital, which was a concern. So it was a way of getting light and plants into the hospital without it, uh, actually directly impacting the uh, mechanical system of the building. Uh, it also worked into the story of the building. Uh, this is an upper level uh, kind of uh, attempt to make a kind of quadrangle space uh, in a very dense, uh, again, having uh, respite areas for patients, for staff, for uh, uh, in, within the hospital. So <clears throat> even though this was done, probably designed more than actually 15 years ago, it goes back, um, It's it's been called uh, the hospital of the future because of what we built into the hospital in terms of areas of response. And originally it was... Uh, it was it got a it got a grant uh, to be the regional uh, disaster preparedness center, and everybody was thinking about 9/11 and uh, biological disasters maybe uh, at the time. Uh, so it was built to respond and and flex and change uh, in terms of uh, both the beds, the mechanical system, uh, the, and the air system of the building. Uh, so the lobby itself became part became part of the uh, response to the COVID. It was able to uh, the, the columns of the in the lobby had column covers which could be removed and had all the surgical uh, uh, medical gases and and uh, uh, all the support areas to convert into a. Uh, environment uh, an emergency department you can see that on the next slide what actually happened is the the emergency department itself moved into the lobby space and the original uh, emergency department uh, handled covid patients so there were two emergency departments one for just uh, uh, minor uh, injuries and the other for covid uh, and each of those, each of the emergency department had pods where we could uh, shift over to isolation rooms and the, the actual uh, emergency bay for, uh, for the health uh, uh, vehicles uh, could be converted as well with fold down walls. So the whole idea of having a flex space within the hospital created from public space was uh, an important idea in terms of having the hospital respond. The other issue is converting them, immediately converting the mechanical system from negative to positive pressure, which creates isolation rooms. Those are the kinds of rooms that are necessary for the treatment of COVID. So the mechanical system was designed with higher floor to floor heights and special equipment to allow, allow uh, minimum uh, uh, adjustments to the mechanical to create an, each room have a negative pressure. So negative pressure allows each room to be isolated so it doesn't contaminate the rest of the hospital. It's critical for the uh, treatment of COVID. And the plan itself uh, can take the medical, regular medical surge beds and convert any of the beds into isolation beds with uh, negative pressure. So the, this flowing plan uh, allows for flexibility of, of uh, change of uh, configuration of, of nursing units, which the original cross-shaped plan wouldn't do. Then moving on to another project that whose idea was mainly using research to of, of a particular uh, kind of medical condition, neurological uh, con conditions, uh, and using research from, of patients to determine the architecture and skin of the building, which became, so the architecture helped out the, the healing process within the building. Uh, we had a panel of, of various uh, patients from various hospitals, uh, give us ideas about what they thought was successful and what wasn't. Uh, we also researched the disease. Uh, 
uh, the various diseases, neurological uh, diseases, to determine what what the actual architecture and skin of the building could do. And we discovered that uh, the uh, people wanted uh, were disoriented, so they wanted natural light, but they were also very concerned about uh, glare. So we came up with a system, a kind of scrim system over the uh, upper areas of the project where the where the various uh, treatment areas were, uh, which allow light in, but 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 not an intense light, and the, so the the next so this grim picks up light. It's kind of got a biophilic uh, kind of pattern to it. Uh, light changes over time, so it's using that uh, kind of ex ex experiential uh, uh, feeling and the, and the uh, light uh, changing changing of the uh, light to uh, uh, allow people as a kind of wayfinding device uh, through the hospital. So, and you see this the skin shown here it changes during the day on the outside and the inside and it and it's follows the the main circulation point from in the building that leads into the various clinics and treatment areas so so that and it's also oriented to the to the main street so that people can look they can still look through the scrim and orient back to where they are because the, the, the main concern that we we heard was people being uh, disoriented so using daylight to orient people uh, was a very critical concern that drove the architecture you can see that here the third project that uh, we also presented at WAF uh, a, a while back uh, is this uh, project project for a, a Women's and Children's Hospital and and uh, a gender violence center in outside of outside of Nairobi. We were hired by the Jordan Foundation to design a hospital, because, but our because of our hospital experience. But uh, Mrs. Jordan, who has actually worked quite a bit in Kenya, various uh, buildings efforts, said, "Please don't make it look like a hospital. People won't go to the hospital there." surrounded by small villages. So the whole idea was to bring in modern technology uh, for kind of the global reach of the building, but also respond locally to the uh, architecture of the villages surrounding the center. So people would feel welcome and wouldn't feel intimidated going to a large, uh, a large hospital. So the building, we took the program and broke it up into a series of pavilions, small scale pavilions. And then arranged the pavilions along a street, uh, stepping down the hill, there was a hundred foot drop in the hill. Oriented the building so that it picked up, we used as much natural ventilation and passive energy uh, as possible in the building. You can see the series, uh, the idea of the uh, the pavilions with a kind of street that goes down the center, with the gender violence center at the bottom, which is the most sensitive area of the hospital for people visiting, and also separated the air conditioning uh, spaces, which are the diagnostic areas, the surgeries and radiologies, in a plinth. Those are usually the areas that are very massive. So we wanted to bury that visually to make it a more of a base for the pavilions. And that's also the area that needs the air conditioning. And then above that are open area, open the open pavilions, which allow air to go through natural ventilation as well as uh, sun uh, into the uh, pavilions above. So a way of integrating technology in without increasing the scale of the building. You can see that here, the, the use of natural materials that are common to the area, the uh, simple 
metal, corrugated metal roofs, uh, stone and stucco. Uh, and the idea that usually families visiting come, they're very large families that come and visit and we needed a large lobby, but couldn't afford it. So we use outdoor spaces because of the climate for large waiting areas uh, for uh, patients. Uh, this is a view of the uh, stepping uh, street that goes down the hill. And, and the idea of, of having, uh, like the sanatoriums earlier, uh, open areas for sun ventilation uh, as part of the healing process. Last project uh, is a project that Gene and I worked on recently. It's a uh, hospital uh, as part of American University of Beirut's medical campus. Uh, and the idea here was to take a very, very dense, uh, complicated uh, planning problem and a hospital and hollow out the insides and, and scale the building down into a series of components and then insert various public spaces at different levels of the building, uh, which you can see here. So, so expressing various parts, the base of the building with the diagnostics, the oncology and pediatric beds. And, and over that is kind of a, a, a scrim that uh, uh, dapples the, uh, and, and, and shields the, uh, the daylighting and, uh, for the, for, for the beds. You can see that here. So the scrim that goes around the building uh, varies according to uh, orientation. And then uh, working with the zoning ordinance, which was kind of a tri uh, triangular zoning ordinance, uh, breaking the building down into parts, clinical oncology and pediatric, as I mentioned, and then inserting green areas in the interstices between these elements of the building. And then the idea of, of actually carving out the inside of the building, and this had to be carefully done with all the intricate uh, planning of the connections and, and various departments of the building, but hollowing out a, a, a center of the building to allow daylight to come into the into the interior of the building and filter it similar to kind of almost like uh, a symbol of uh, Lebanon, which is the, the cedar tree uh, as a kind of filter to get light down into the, into the project. And uh, so the, the roof has a, a heliostat, which picks up the sun, uh, to, bounces it through light tube and down into the lobby and actually below grade. It's quite a dense building. So we wanted to get light not only on the edges, but into the interior of the building. And we worked back and forth with planning and architecture together to try to create this a ver really vertical a healing environment, which you see here in the lobby uh, with the light penetrating uh, through the whole project. And a series of, of public and, and semi-public spaces. This is at the mid-level of the building, has a, a running walking track as well as a cafeteria. Uh, next, the, uh, the idea of uh, on stage, off stage again from, from Rush with a series of three-story uh, waiting spaces with the beds uh, behind, stacked up the building. And the patient room itself, which, and we have, each patient room has a, a, a series of uh, plants as well as the, the scrim the, on the outside to dapple the light and allow for views of the Mediterranean as well as the, the plants that uh, uh, are on each, uh, each bed level. Did you want to say something about nursing unit? Oh, 
So in the uh, nurse stations and throughout the interiors of the hospital, we've mimicked daylight with uh, specialty lighting that can be uh, circadian rhythm timed, but also change colors depending on the uh, weather or the uh, uh, type of unit. So um, it's a way to bring daylight into the deepest parts of the building. So the project is really a, an integration of uh, planning and, and architecture and uh, somewhat harkens back to some of the things that sanatoriums did in terms of relating back to the environment. At the top of the building is at the top of this, uh, where the scrim terminates is another kind of respite garden uh, for the staff. So those are like four projects that where we actually examine and re-examine the standard typology and adjusted it to culture, climate, and place. So the last thing we want to talk about is where is medicine going? What is the, the future of health and how will it impact hospitals in the future? As we think about the, uh, the future of health, Clearly, it's a vast, vast topic. And today, we'd like to focus on those aspects of the future that affect the physical place and the environment in which care is delivered. And when we think about health and total health design, there are aspects that we consider for every project. Um, they range from uh, broad uh, contextual items like population health, culture, and demographics. They include the advances in science and medicine, and clearly the idea of resilience, which uh, we think about in not only sustainability and climate change, but also the resilience of the business resilience of um, the functionality as well as uh, the ability to withstand unknown events. And lastly, but most importantly, probably is technology when we think about the impact that has. Some of the um, approaches are on a macro scale where we are doing health district planning with cities and communities this is in Baton Rouge, and it's a collaborative effort with the city, uh, multiple hospitals and universities, as well as business entities to create a health district that is going to be an economic driver for the revitalization of Baton Rouge. And in thinking about this and the notion of creating healthy, healing cities, and urban places that include nature, fitness and wellness, as well as the ability to bring um, different business and research entities together to advance science and medicine. At the building level, when we look at uh, contextual developments on a community scale, this is a uh, fitness and wellness center that is part of a mixed use development with housing, education, uh, parks, and woodlands that um, are accessible from this fitness and wellness center that also includes consultations, classes, nutrition, etc. And then the science and medicine aspects are increasingly becoming part of our healthcare environments. So whether they're embedded within the buildings or on the same campus or adjacent, um, they are more and more a collaborative partner for healthcare providers. This is um, the research lab at Northwestern University, adjacent to the medical campus. And as Ralph talked about in the projects that uh, we just saw, biophilia and the ability to bring nature daylight and materiality that recalls um, uh, nature is part of the documented research for healing and better outcomes for patients and families, as well as caregivers. 
And you can see in this recent project at um, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital that we have incorporated planters outside every patient room shown on the right that uh, is similar to what we did at the American University Beirut to bring nature closer to each patient. And an area that's increasingly critical globally is the issue of staff shortage and staff retention. There are um, many, many stressors for caregivers and people who work in hospital settings. And now, as we all know, and it's been highlighted by the COVID-19 experience is staff burnout. We've been addressing this um, in all of our facilities through uh, the process of designing spaces just for staff that are welcoming, that uh, provide them daylight, uh, that provide settings where they can collaborate, relax, but also outdoor spaces such as the ones that Ralph showed at Rush and AUB, where we have healing outdoor spaces, whether they're rooftop or on ground, just for staff. We're also providing meditative spaces, respite areas as well for um, the staff so they can get away and recharge. This is probably one of the most critical aspects for how we design environments that are supportive of people. And as we move to the idea of technology, this is also a very broad and very complex area that will have significant impact on our facilities. As we all know, in the COVID environment, the idea of going to your doctor in person has become a challenge. So the health, uh, telehealth visit has become really, really popular. And on the left is a telehealth suite for providers at the Mayo Clinic. And on the right is a Kaiser Clinic for uh, in-person visits. And as we know, uh, Kaiser has already experienced pre-COVID more than half of their visits being virtual already. And that has gone up significantly since COVID. So the notion of providing uh, both virtual and in-person visits has an impact on the design of the spaces. We all know about bionics and uh, prostheses and computer-aided uh, therapies and treatments, but we also are creating now environments in which people and machines of all kinds will cohabitate. And what does that mean for the environments that we're creating in terms of space, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, access, etc., and to uh, support caregivers and back injuries avoidance. Uh, there are robots that can lift patients and transfer them. So we uh, provide safety for the staff. There are robots that obviously deal with telehealth and telemedicine, but also transport things and provide uh, navigation and wayfinding and automation and delivery. And then the thing um, that is probably closest to everyone is wearables and connectivity. And the notion that your Fitbit, your iWatch is connected to your phone or tablet or computer, which is connected then to your doctor or um, healthcare provider. And it's a wellness tool as well as a healthcare tool. So it can be used um, to capture data uh, about your wellness routines and provide reminders for medications or uh, appointments to um, visit uh, the caregivers. Or it can also be used increasingly to provide intervention. So uh, your phone can become an EKG machine uh, and take a reading. Uh, your iPods can become uh, blood pressure measures and transmit that information, all leading to um, a world 
in which things are even more interconnected than they are now, both uh, passive information capture, such as uh, the data on your uh, iWatch or Fitbit, but also uh, extending to the world around us and the environments we live in. So the notion that um, uh, connectivity is also to the buildings that we're designing and the ability to provide information to um, the occupants. And I think that um, one of the key things that awareness of COVID and the spread of disease has brought to us is an awareness that the environment is something we need to know about. So the notion that um, buildings will be able to report to visitors, occupants, or staff that the air quality, the airflow, the air changes, the particulate matter, the, the, uh, the bacteria level of a surface is critical um, in the health and well-being of people going forward. And then lastly, the idea of materiality and uh, resilience. So this is uh, the emergency department lobby at the University of Virginia Hospital, which just opened and has been um, a space that has been flexible and adaptable to screen COVID or non-COVID patients going into the emergency department and to the hospital. But more importantly, you can see that it's a biophilic design with uh, curves, with uh, softness, with calm uh, in an emergency stressful setting. The materials are easy to clean and uh, non-porous, no joints, no right angles, all leading to the perception that a patient or a visitor is safe because the environment feels clean and um, resilient. And we come now back to E. Todd Wheeler's idea that environments for health shouldn't be necessarily machine-like, but supporting the human spirit and wellness. And as we come to the uh, approach again, we're still looking at total health, but as you can see, each of the areas that we've talked about and many more are so multi-layered, multi-dimensional and complex that uh, we need to consistently and constantly research and develop new ideas and thinking about how these will affect the uh, places that we're designing. At the end, it's all about simplicity. It's about designing for humans and supporting their health and well being, as well as the work that they do, and um, using research and uh, broad inputs to inform the work that we do. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of our learnings with you. I'll just say that uh, it's really impossible to predict the future. Uh, I think we learned that with COVID. All we can do is make, uh, as Jean said, make buildings as resilient uh, and open to change uh, as possible. Jeremy, I'm going to turn it back to you. It's, it's an old decision. Well, thank you, uh, Ralph and Jean, for um, uh, uh, two journeys, I think. One journey through time, uh, the last hundred years of healthcare design, and even though Ralph says you can't foresee the future with any certainty, perhaps a little glimpse into what the future of uh, healthcare environments might be. Um, and also, of course, a journey around the world. We've been to Africa, we've been to the Middle East, we've been to various locations in uh, North America. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about what designing for healthcare, which basically the needs of healthcare, the, the, the mechanics of healthcare, don't change that much what's needed and what treatments can be provided. Um, but it's the cultural context that might change. I wonder if you can say a bit about what you might have learned from working in such different locations, in particular, 
what working on a sophisticated healthcare project in Kenya might be fed back into perhaps North America. Yeah, I think the the Kenya project was kind of an eye-opening experience of, uh, of, of uh, it's something that uh, what Mrs. Jordan, who's worked in Kenya, our client, brought up. Uh, I probably wouldn't have thought that way uh, initially in terms of uh, what a hospital should be, I think. But you have to think of not only the technology, but uh, the, the actual culture of the people that are using the building and making it so that uh, it becomes, you know, part of the fabric of the building. It's localized. It has local materials. Uh, it has the scale scale of the surroundings, uh, which wouldn't as much be an issue in the in the U.S. Uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, the whole idea of adjusting a typology to that extent uh, was an eye-opening experience for me. And, and, and it also has to do with uh, available funds, infrastructure that's not as reliable. So the whole idea of uh, passive sustainability uh, is a big issue, I think, in all of Africa. Uh, and and I think actually goes back to those principles of the sanatorium where you're using using the environment as a as a healing because it's a very uh, it's seventy degrees Fahrenheit uh, all year round there so it's a very benign kind of climate to take advantage of for the hospital so I think all those things climate culture have to be factored into the to the hospital as I said in the talk to you know it's integrating global and local together in the right in the right mix for where you're working good thank you and I, I I wonder if you can say a little bit about how you Perkins and will as you know a very large firm of architects and also uh, designers of very large hospitals how you work with uh, the medical evolving medical expertise do you directly employ medical professionals? Do you uh, commission external consultants to give advice, or do you depend on developing relationships with your clients on these projects to bring in the necessary expertise? We um, do all of the above. When we uh, are working with clients, we work with uh, the leadership, obviously, and their vision. We work with um, many, many participants, sometimes hundreds of users and uh, frontline workers to provide input. And increasingly, we are uh, working with communities and community engagement to get their input as to what the facility and the campus should include. So this is um, uh, a much broader design process than even um, pre 10 years ago, where community input was less uh, desirable by the leadership, uh, where there was more of a barrier between the hospital campus and the community adjacent. Um, these days, the porosity, the integration with the community has become much more important to the institution and to the residents. So this is um, a complex process of engagement at many, many levels. Yes, and I, I think one of the things that strikes me from what you're saying is the way in which um, health provision uh, might be reintegrated into the normal patterns of life, which of course makes all sorts of sense, that healthcare isn't seen as something that is detached from the rest of life. It's actually a part of, of, of life. And this sort of comes up, I think, in your Baton Rouge project in particular, where you're looking very specifically at how healthcare and, and health facilities, including research and probably teaching, uh, can be um, a part of the life and the physical fabric of that city. 
Now, this came up in an earlier discussion this afternoon where uh, we looked at um, the way in which healthcare, this is, I'm talking about the context of the United Kingdom, um, the, the uh, town planning had fallen under the uh, control of the Ministry of Health until the, between the mid 19th century and the 1940s, when uh, a new Ministry of Town and Country Planning was created. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health was then creating the National Health Service and had um, an enormous task on its hands. And I wonder if you can say a bit more about how you would see this integration of the, the whole totality of health provision and health thinking and health education um, to be integrated into the city as it, as it is on ba in Baton Rouge, and to some extent in the Rush Hospital in Chicago, where clearly the context, the urban context, has had an influence on the design. Do you want Do you to respond wanna, to that? Yeah, <laughs> I'll let you talk about Baton Rouge, I think. The um, complexity of hospitals and healthcare is um, quite extensive. And increasingly, the trend is to deliver care and provide wellness closer to home. And this is, I think, um, uh, a major driver, becoming a major driver in North America. But I think it uh, is and will become even more of a global trend. And that is um, good because it breaks down the scale, makes it less uh, intimidating, as Ralph was talking about in Kenya, um, and also more integrated into the fabric of daily life, as you're talking about, Jeremy, because uh, we're seeing community health centers as part of uh, community recreation centers as part of schools, uh, as part of office building complexes, and um, even integrated with some hotels in an urban setting. So the idea that you would be able to get care and or see a provider or uh, go to a nutrition class or uh, rehabilitation uh, close to home, maybe even within walking distance, here in um, Los Angeles, there is a physician group that um, has clinics at uh, transit stops so that you could go on your way to or from work on your daily commute without making an additional stop. So we're seeing much more of this and it becomes part of your wellness routine is embedded in your daily routine. Yes, I think that's a very interesting trend. And I suppose it not only has an impact on the design of infrastructure, in that case, of transit stations, uh, but also on uh, the way in which, uh, you know, you design healthcare facilities. I mean, I can imagine that uh, given that, um, you, I'm not sure whether you'll have heard in the US, but uh, the United Kingdom has approved one of the COVID vaccines for use as from next week. But the big challenge is now going to be how to deliver it to 60, 70 million people who live in the UK um, and integrating it into you know, daily routines, whether it's through transport, whether it's through school, whether it's through office, would clearly make a great deal of sense with that. Um, and some of that may need to be temporary and some of it may need to be permanent. Uh, and I wonder if you can just give some, some more indications as to how you might see health affecting the design of other building typologies? I think uh, today the issue of um, building safety and that awareness level of COVID, everybody wants to know that the building they're entering is safe. Both what they can see in terms of materials, cleanliness, cleaning, etc. But also what they can't see, which is the more frightening part, as we've all learned from COVID, uh, air quality, air flows, air changes, um, filtration, etc. Everyone now knows much more about HVAC than 
they ever wanted to know. And so how do we, um, how do we design the systems to provide that comfort level, but then how do we display that in some way and make it accessible, that information accessible to uh, the average person? That is uh, something that uh, building owners and landlords are working on right now uh, to give comfort and uh, the sense of security to occupants. So I think that's that's going to have a big impact on building design, maybe not the form, but certainly the environment. Yes, I'm sure. And of course, um, in the 19th century, um, many people tried to avoid hospitals precisely because they didn't have good air quality, they didn't have good water quality. Um, and it was the gradual uh, improvements in those, uh, in ventilation, in daylight, all those things that you were talking about as being you know, the use of natural uh, uh, conditions uh, to improve health outcomes, which we are rediscovering. And I think you're showing how they can be used as very creative forces in the um, design of hospitals. So thank you very much to Ralph Johnson and Jean Ma for a fascinating tour, as I say, through time and through space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.